Good afternoon, everybody listening to this webinar arranged by the ESU and um, the EIU, European Association of Urology. Today we are discussing what to do, what's the optimal treatment of recurrence uh, disease in the treated kidney. Um, we have um, a program that will follow and the first week it will be uh, Axel Beck's. Axel Beck is, um, is the clinical lead consultant in, in um, Royal Free London Hospital. Please, Axel. Yeah, thank you very much. You can Eric. take the introduction. Let me share my slides first. They should be visible right now. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. It was the idea to give a five minute talk on local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. What do we understand um, under this, this topic? These are my disclosures. They're all unrelated to this talk, basically. Now, I think the most important thing we can say is that local recurrence after partial nephrectomy is actually quite rare. However, it has been shown to be dependent on tumor size and positive margin status. And um, a good example of this is, for example, if you go to the higher tumor stages, where there's actually very little evidence from randomized controlled trials to do partial nephrectomy, we have some series uh, that described that in patients who had positive surgical margins, the local recurrence rate in CT2 stages and higher was actually 16%. And in those we had non-surgical margins, um, it was only 3%. In addition, we had two systematic reviews, which included all CT stages, which described an increased risk of local recurrence after positive surgical margins with a hazard ratio of 6.11, which means it's a six-fold increase in the risk of developing a local recurrence. And they found a local recurrence rate of roughly 5%. But this was also the criticism. Um, we have repeated a systematic review very recently where we focused on the T stages that are more commonly um, undergoing partial nephrectomy. So the PT1 stages, PT1, uh, PT1A and PT1B. What you can see in the um, consort diagram here is that we started with all, uh, almost 2,050 publications. But in the end, once you filter it down, we could only take eight into the analysis. What also showed, and you will see this on the, on the next slide, is, is that many of these studies were actually quite heterogeneous, but what they all showed is, is that having no positive surgical margin was actually associated with a lower risk of developing a um, local recurrence. Uh, and only two of these trials were actually, actually statistically significant. Now, these odds ratios range between 0.04 and 0.27. And um, as you can see in this slide, they were all very uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous, these studies. And what you can see is that many of these studies actually used um, different techniques of the procedure. Some of them uh, compared open partial nephrectomy to robotic assisted partial nephrectomy. But we also had some who compared open to laparoscopic partial nephrectomy and others who only described laparoscopic partial nephrectomies. Now, you can see that the, the follow-up differed, but also the number of procedures included. But what we do see is that the positive surgical margin rate ranges up to 34.4%, which is the outlier. And it would be quite interesting to actually see what happened. But this is also a smaller study here. The um, tumor size was relatively homogeneous between these studies. Most of them were actually in the range of 2.8, uh, a little bit more to 3.5 centimeters. But what you could see is that there is a huge difference in the percentage of local recurrences in those who had a positive surgical margin described. And this ranges from uh, no um, local recurrence to up to 11.9. But you can also clearly see that this risk or the percentage of a local recurrence is definitely lower in those who had no surgical positive margin. And then finally, I would briefly touch on this um, publication, which came out recently as well, which is um, one of the first that actually looked at exclusively a group of patients that underwent robotic assisted partial nephrectomy. 
this is currently um, for most of us the standard um, in, in uh, those countries where the robot is available. And you can see that this has almost completely taken over the open partial nephrectomies and the laparoscopic partial nephrectomies. And therefore, it was actually quite interesting to look into these um, details. So what they found is contrary to the systematic review, which I just mentioned, is that in their evaluation, there had been no effect on local recurrence-free survival, whether you had a positive surgical margin or not. But what they found, and I think this is quite interesting, this would be my last slide before I hand back uh, to Börje, is that uh, having a higher renal score, having a higher warm ischemia time, which is a surrogate for complexity, otherwise you wouldn't take longer, and having a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma were all statistically associated with positive surgical margins. And with the chromophobes, this is known because they don't have a pseudo capsule. So without further ado, I would just now like to hand back to Börje and uh, he will then introduce the next speakers. Thank you very much. Stop sharing. Thank you, Axel. Thank you for this introduction to the subject. And I will introduce Umberto Capitano, urologist from San Rafael Hospital in Milan, Italy. Please, Umberto. That's it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Umberto Capitano. I'm a neurologist in San Rafael Hospital. And actually, I'm very happy uh, to show you some data recently published in this specific topic. I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, because local recurrence after partial nephrectomy uh, is a rare entity. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, evidences that are available are few, and I think it's important to go over the guidelines, the recommendations, and what we can do in our daily clinical practice for patients that are going to have a local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. I don't have specific conflict of interest related to the, the topic, and I would like to, um, um, to highlight that all the, the data that I'm going to show you is only related to local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. So we are not going to discuss about local recurrence after radical nephrectomy. That is actually a little bit different topic uh, with, a, with a, a slightly different uh, recommendations uh, when a, a patient after radical nephrectomy may have a local recurrence. So what I'm going to show you only applies to patients that receive an open or a robotic or a laparoscopic partial nephrectomy. If you take a look to the guidelines, uh, um, the summary of evidence uh, is related to the prevalence of the, of the, the event that is very rare, as uh, Professor Bex just highlighted to you. Uh, the overall, uh, if you take all the papers that were published, the prevalence of local recurrence during a follow-up after partial nephrectomy uh, goes to, uh, from 0.5% to 5%, so a mean prevalence uh, that is below 2%, so it's a relatively rare entity. The surgical or percutaneous treatment of a local recurrence uh, usually should be considered uh, in absence of systemic progression, especially in absence of adverse prognostic parameters and favorable performance status. I'm going more in details in the next slides. I'm going to show you which are, for example, the advanced prognostic parameters that you should consider to treat uh, a local recurrence during the follow-up. You can see that the level of evidences of all uh, these data is actually only three because there are no randomized clinical trials very few, um, very few uh, trials that uh, just uh, took a look to this specific topic after partial nephrectomy. Very few prospective series. Most of the data comes from uh, uh, retrospective data published, especially in tertiary care centers. And indeed, the final evidence is that the most optimal modality of local treatment for locally recurrent RCC after nephron sparing uh, procedure is uh, nowadays not defined and probably will be very important in the next future what, we, what is going to be published, especially in the translational research because obviously the uh, biomarkers uh, and also the radiomics uh, uh, will help in better 
uh, selecting those patients that may deserve a local treatment uh, of a locally recurrent RCC. So the final recommendation according to the 2022 uh, EAU guidelines uh, is uh, to offer local treatment of a locally recurrent disease when te technically possible and also after balancing adverse prognostic features, comorbidities and also life expectancy. A locally recurrent disease can affect the tumor bearing kidney after partial nephrectomy or after focal ablative therapy. And also, Professor Wakden will uh, go more in details regarding focal ablative therapy in the next presentation. I will focus the next slides on the local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. It's very important a classification that was proposed five years ago by Alessandro Antonelli. Uh, because uh, they were able to define the three different kinds of local recurrence of partial nephrectomy. And I'm going to show you that this classification is not only important to pro pro for prognosis, but also for clinical decision making, because uh, these are completely different uh, uh, biologies and uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, and this uh, is very important that uh, should be defined when the locally recurrent disease is detected. The first type is the incomplete resection of the primary tumor at the time of partial nephrectomy. The second time is the local spread of the tumor by microvascular embolization. And finally, the third kind is the tumor multifocality. Let's have a look to the three types of local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. This is the type A, so type one, the incomplete resection of the primary tumor. You can see in the CT scan figure A, an enhancing mass close to the hyperdense spots due to the suture of partial nephrectomy. In the uh, macroscopic image, so image B, you can see the relapsing tumor close to the uh, Teflon plugs. And then you have the microscopic uh, um, uh, picture, a uh, picture C, with uh, cancer cells mixed to granulomas due to sutures that can be that are that are highlighted by the black arrows. In the second time, you have uh, the local recurrence of a partial nephrectomy that is due to the local spread of the tumor by microvascular embolization. In this case, figure A, you can see the enhancing mass close to the hyperdense spots due to the suture of partial nephrectomy. In figure B, you can see the granulomas due to the sutures and also cancer cells that are not included in the sutures. And finally, figure C, you can see the, the microvascular embolization. Then you have the type C, type 3. Uh, in this case, uh, you have at the CT scan the ipsilateral relapse. However, in contrary with the, the, tape, the type A and type B, you can see that the macroscopic section shows the, the position of the recurrent dis, uh, disease distant from the previous resection. And in this case, figure C, you can uh, also uh, see the normal parenchymae with the surrounding scar reaction. Why this is so important, not just for classification, as I said, um, obviously these are only a limited number of patients because as I said, the, the, the number of local recurrence of partial nephrectomy is, is a rare entity. But what uh, Alessandro Antonelli showed uh, is that natural history of the disease is uh, related to this kind of different type of locally local recurrence. For example, in, t in type A and type B, you can have also very, very fast progression with the natural history, with also some cancer-specific mortality due to the relapsing disease. Conversely, the type C, so the true multifocality, usually show a very nice uh, natural history because probably you can uh, face the disease also, for example, with the focal therapies and other options. And in this case, it is not on, always uh, a, associated with a systematic uh, progression of the disease. Also, imaging may help. This is a very uh, recent paper that was published showing that the local recurrence of renal cell carcinoma of partial nephrectomy can be also detected and also characterized according to the MRI. 
because the apparent diffusion coefficient at the multiparameter uh, MRI can help to uh, see uh, the normal parenchyma, the, the presence of a rec rec recurrent disease, but also the presence of the benign tissue uh, close to the, to the um, local recurrence. So the apparent diffusion coefficient may help to better identify the local recurrence, but also the part of the uh, kidney that uh, is not affected by the recurrence, uh, but uh, is uh, just the consequence of the partial nephrectomy that was performed, uh, for example, some, uh, some month uh, um, before. So I told you that uh, it's important to see also if advanced prognostic parameters uh, are there, because in this case, you should consider whether or not uh, to deliver the uh, local treatment in case of uh, recurrence. And which are those uh, adverse prognostic parameters? First of all, the time interval since treatment of the primary tumor and the local uh, recurrence. A short time usually is associated with also a systematic progression of the disease. And with short time interval, uh, I mean usually uh, less than one year, but especially for those patients that have a recurrence in the first three, four months after the primary tumor uh, treatment. The second adverse prognostic parameter is the presence of the sarcomatoid differentiation, especially in the recurrent lesion. And finally, as I said also before, the type A and type B uh, local recurrence are usually associated with a uh, very unfavorable um, natural history uh, after local recurrence. So the question is, which treatment in case of local recurrence after partial nephrectomy we should deliver to our patient? And uh, we have now a few paper uh, papers that address this topic. Uh, all the papers uh, were published in the last uh, two or three years because uh, it was the result of multi-institutional cohorts that tried to put together many centers to have at least uh, uh, some patients to be included in. However, although those multi-institutional cohorts, you can see that, for example, this was published uh, this year in European Neurology, uh, uh, only, I would say, uh, 67 patients were included, although it was a multi-institutional international consortium. In this case, in this specific case, Alberto Martini published the options uh, to use also salvage robot-assisted renal surgery for local re recurrence after surgical resection or also after renal mass ablation. And that was the first paper that tried to at least provide a classification, the technique, and also clinical outcomes of those patients, showing uh, in summary that this kind of surgery should be uh, referred to tertiary care center because uh, it, it's a little bit more complex. And also because uh, since uh, can be considered a rare event, also the expertise and also the multidisciplinary team meeting is very important to decide not only the indication for the local treatment, but also um, which kind of timing and which kind of option we should offer to the patient. The second important paper uh, was published again this year. You can see that still we have less than, less than 100 patients, although it was a very important uh, French consortium, including patients treated with a percutaneous ablation versus a surgical resection for local re recurrence and following partial nephrectomy for renal cell cancer. So it uh, will be very important in the next future to go ahead with this kind of multi-institutional consortium because it's the only way to get at least uh, more than 100 patients. And this will provide also additional prognostic factors uh, uh, or markers that may help to select which kind of patient, which kind of treatment we should consider when a, a renal cell rec rec recurrence is detected after partial nephrectomy. To summarize, uh, also the guidelines suggest that many options can be considered for the uh, local rec recurrence treatment after partial nephrectomy. The most important are surgery, both partial or radical nephrectomy, 
radiotherapy and especially SBRT that is becoming more and more important because it is able to deliver uh, a specific treatment uh, in a non-invasive way and uh, again some uh, trials uh, uh, not uh, randomized but at least prospective are ongoing and uh, uh, additional results will be available in the next future. Focal therapy uh, is one of the uh, most important uh, uh, options that we can cons consider and Professor Walkden will, uh, will uh, provide uh, additional data in this specific setting in the next presentation. And finally, systemic medical therapy, not for the treatment of the solitary local recurrence, but as I said also before, when local recurrence is detected uh, in a few months later uh, uh, after a, a partial nephrectomy, usually this is also associated with a systematic progression. And in that case, the systematic medical therapy is uh, provided and is delivered to the patient, but more for the, I would say, systemic progression rather than to treat the local recurrence. However, as I said before, and also as a very importantly highlighted by the guidelines, the most effective salvage procedure has not yet been defined. So if you want to uh, summarize uh, all the data, uh, we can conclude that the local rec recurrence after partial nephrectomy is rare, less than 2%. This can be related to the incomplete resection of primary tumor, type A, or local spread of the tumor by, micro, by my microvascular embolization, type B, or type C, the tumor multifocality. And I show you that this is important, not just for classification, but also for clinical decision-making after the detection of the local recurrence. Then the treatment should be considered, but only when technically possible, first, in absence of systemic progression, because in that case, the medical therapy, especially the combination of TKI inhibitors plus immunotherapy is probably the most important treatment and not to treat a local recurrence disease. Third, in absence of adverse prognostic parameters, as I said, uh, is mainly sarcomatoid features, for example, the timing of the local rec recurrence and the type of the local recurrence of the partial nephrectomy. And finally, in those patients with a favorable performance status and also uh, a good life expectancy, because obviously a local recurrence disease in an elderly, frail patient probably can be just observed and not treated. So I, I thank you for your attention and I will be very, very happy also to discuss uh, with also the other speakers uh, uh, about this, uh, I think, very, very important, interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. Thanks for this presentation. And um, we go further on to uh, Miles. Um, Walkden, uh, interventional radiologist from uh, University College in London Hospital. Please, Miles, welcome to show your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so my name is Mars Walton. I'm an interventional radiologist uh, and I work at University College Hospital in London and the Royal Free Hospital in London. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, thermal ablation, although I don't seem to be sharing. Just a second. Perfect. So what treatment can we recommend in patients with local recurrence after partial nephrectomy? Well, I think we've already heard that this is uh, a, an impossible question to ask, uh, to answer with the data that we currently have. And as has been alluded to, that's because the recurrence rates following partial nephrectomy are low. Uh, it is also, unfortunately, because there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. Uh, and the treatments that have been offered for recurrence. It's not just partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, 
it's whether that's open uh, robotic assisted laparoscopic assisted and then ablation there's cryo there's microwave there's radio frequency uh, sbrt surveillance systemic treatment um also some of the norm nomenclature i found a little unclear when i first started looking into this because um i didn't realize that a metachronous tumor um, is being classified as local recurrence. Um, and also, the other thing I was just wondering about is, is converting to a radical nephrectomy after you're intending to perform a salvage partial nephrectomy. Is that a complication or not a complication? Perhaps we could discuss that. Um, this um, paper, I think, is excellent um, and has already been um, alluded to by um, Umberto. Um, but basically, um, as you can see the data is sparse so there are only four um uh, papers here um the, the latest being 2015 and this is reporting on salvage ablation after nephron sparing surgery the only thing that does stand out is you can see that the treatment success in all of them is a hundred percent um but if you look at the special characteristics you can see that actually a lot of these patients uh, had vhl um, so that's metachronous tumor is not true local recurrence. And you can also see that the type of ablation that has been used um, is variable, uh, radio frequency, cryoablation uh, in these uh, settings. Um, and then uh, these are um, the uh, figures here for repeat um, surgery uh, following um, partial nephrectomy. And you can see here that actually a lot of these ones are all open and yet we're now i think getting to the age of, of robot assisted um, uh, surgery um, and they very usefully came up with this um, diagram of how possibly we might like to manage recurrence after um, local recurrence um, the only thing that i would say is that uh, thermal ablation there uh, comes in second after being a surgical candidate so let's look into that. Um, this is, um, again, um, a good paper. Um, and basically on this one, um, this was the, there were 32 post partial nephrectomy, there were 35 uh, post thermal ablation, but we're talking about post partial nephrectomy recurrence here. 12 of those for metachronous tumor, so I would take those out. That leaves you 20 post uh, partial nephrectomy uh, of which six underwent um, salvaged radical partial nephrectomy, two had an interoperative bleed, so that's a 33% complication rate. Uh, the um, local recurrence free survival was 64, um, and then 14 of those ended up having a salvaged radical um, uh, nephrectomy. Um, the interesting thing in those is, from what I understand, and we can have a chat about this, uh, that seven of those were actually converted. They were starting off being a salvage um, radical partial and were converted to radical uh, uh, nephrectomy, um, which I think tells you that this surgery is quite difficult. 35% um, were post um, thermal ablation and they all had salvage partial nephrectomy um, and uh, there was complication rate of 20% in those. Um, this was the most up to date, although I, Umberto showed a, a paper that I hadn't seen, um, thermal ablation um, following uh, recurrence. And um, this is um, from Harvard. Um, they had 11 uh, patients post partial nephrectomy um, that they treated. And unfortunately, you can see they treated them with radio frequency ablation, cryotherapy, and microwave. They had one minor complication, which is a minor hemorrhage. Um, and have got a good um, local progression free survival of 91% and no significant change in EGFR. Um, okay, but this is what I wanted to say is, you know, surgery is a very complex thing. Look at the two guys on the left. They're very sensible. They're very clever. Uh, and I'm really a bit stupid. So, um, you know, there is no question that radical, uh, that a robotic assisted partial nephrectomy um, is a very complex procedure. There are many steps. Um, you have to create new peritoneum, complex dissection. You have to do the actual resection. You've got to get hemostasis. You've got a warm ischemic time. Uh, you may have to learn intraocular ultrasound to see the tumor. And we, you know, it's well established that there is a, a steep learning curve to that. So it's multi-formatted. Um, 
Whereas thermal ablation, you know, there's two steps to it. You put the needles in the tumor, you may need to do ancillary movements such as hydrodissection or pneumal dissection. There's no warm ischemic time and you can see the tumor even if it's endophytic. So, you know, this is a classic example of me doing a cryoablation. That is me. Unfortunately, it's me on my own. Um, you can see the tumor. Now, whether that's buried in the kidney or not, you can see it. Uh, you stick the needles in uh, and you can see, this is why I'm a fan of cryoablation because you can see the ice ball there. Uh, not only can you see whether you've covered the tumor or not, but you can also see um, that uh, what you're treating surrounding it. Um, so a chain is no stronger than its weakest link and reoperating a kidney tumor is after all the chain. That's Nick from someone. Um, so, you know, if you are having to go through so many steps in order to get to the tumor, uh, you could have a problem with any of those. So it's no question that in the salvage setting, um, repeat partial nephrectomy is going to be difficult because any one of those steps could have difficulties associated with adhesions, loss of normal planes, reduced vision, the loss of tactile feedback. Um, uh, and I think um, most surgeons would accept that doing a reoperation um, is not much fun. Um, but I, interestingly, I think thermal ablation in the salvage setting tends not to be so affected by the distorted anatomy. Quite often, as in this case, you can see uh, there's a tumor, a recurrent tumor here following a partial nephrectomy. Now, obviously, they would have, in this case, they used a, a transperitoneal approach. If we're going to ablate this, we can come from the back. This is virgin territory. Um, it is not a problem. Um, and, you know, you can stick your needles in and you can cause an ablation. There is no question that with sal in the salvage setting ablation, some things can be difficult. If you've got a patient who um, has had a radical nephrectomy and a big scar, you need to avoid that because getting the needles through the scar tissue can be difficult. There's no question that the, the tissue, um, when you're um, sticking needles into it in a, in a recurrence can be firmer. Um, and there's also the fibrotic tissue tends to reduce the size of the ice ball that you form. So we tend to use an extra needle or plan, you know, to put the needles closer together to ensure that we get a, a better ice ball. It also can be more difficult to see the ice ball in the setting of um, uh, salvage treatment. So I think here you can see um, the ice ball quite nicely because this was some more normal tissue and you can see the ice edge there, which is important for us to see. However, when you get down into where the actual surgical bed was, you can see things become a little um, more hazy. Uh, and the reason obviously seeing the ice ball is important to us is that make sure that we're covering the tumor number one, but also that we're not damaging anything um, in the surrounding tissues. Um, lastly, or second, hydrodissection can be more difficult. And remember hydrodissection and pneumodissection is something that we as ablationists rely on quite heavily to move stuff out the way. You guys just shift it out the way, we have to try and push it out the way. Uh, and certainly in, in the salvage radical setting, that can be a problem. Uh, and there is no question, as there is for uh, virgin ablation, um, in some locations within the kidney uh, are more difficult. So the anterior hyla lip, um, you can see here when someone's lying prone, um, which is most often how I treat my patients, you can see there's a tumor there in the anterior hyla lip. I don't mind so much coming down through the kidney, that's okay, but it's all the bowel um, and it tends to be both large bowel and duodenum that get in the way. So the anterior hyla lip can be a bit tricky. Uh, the lower pole, um, again, here's an MRI and there's a tumor, quite a big tumor in the lower pole and this structure right next to it is actually the ureter. So there are things that we can do to try and improve that. But here you can see this is coronal, there's the tumor, and here is the uh, ureter coming down right next to it. So what we don't want to do is freeze that. So we can put a stent in. You see, we put a stent in to try and help protect things. But actually, um, even, even just, just doing that is not enough. So then we can put in new mode dissection. So you put in some air around it, and then you can see there's the ureter surrounded by air. Air is obviously a very good, thermal insulator um, so there are things we can do but it, it is tricky um, so i'll just go through some cases uh, you know and, and again i work 
uh, with Axel and um, a team at the Royal Free, and it's a very high centre. Uh, and I went over my data for the last 10 years, uh, and I've managed to find uh, some total of three cases um, that of, of recurrent uh, tumour that I've treated. So um, it doesn't happen much. Um, this was a 48-year-old chap um, who had left partial nephrectomy in 2008 for PT1A G3 clear cell renal cell carcinoma. He did have a positive margin. He was being followed up, uh, but he was lost to follow-up during COVID and then came back in the scene in 2021. Uh, it was found to have this lesion here. Again, this is an awkward position of the anterior hyalur lip, 16 millimetres. We placed a stent. Um, we ablated it, and when by the ablation time, I mean that's the time from starting to, to finishing, not how long the treatment takes. Um, he stayed in hospital one night, renal function unchanged. Um, so this is what we did. We stuck the needle in. You can see we have to do some hydrodissection to get the bowel out of the way, um, and that's what it looked like um, at six months. So it's getting smaller, and crucially, it doesn't enhance. Um, this is another chap, 67-year-old, um, gentleman who'd had left nephrectomy 2008 for G3 PT2A tumor. Um, in 2019, he had a small nodule in the nephrectomy bed, um, and uh, that was slowly increasing. And so we biopsied it. Uh, there it is. It's not very big. Um, now the problem with the you can see here um, he's got a sort of loss of tissue here from where he had the um, radical nephrectomy. Here is the lesion here. This is the pancreas here, and this is the large bowel. Um, so we lie on his tummy. We put a needle in. Um, we put a couple of needles in this, obviously, because, as I said, I tend to over-treat with the recurrences. Hydrodissection, we treat him, um, and we follow him up at one year. But this is, I know, I'm sorry, I didn't realise we weren't talking about post-radical, but they are undoubtedly with ablation can be tricky secondary to um, difficulty in moving things out of the way um, and there is um, there is the lesion um, at um, one year so it's getting smaller not enhancing uh, and just the interesting thing is you can obviously see where the surgery has been um, from his uh, radical um, I challenge any of you to see where I've been with my needles um, and then lastly, um, this is a 58-year-old lady um, who's very unlucky. She had a right nephrectomy in 2018 for a bottom grade 3 um, PT3B tumour. Then she had this kidney. Uh, this is her other side, so this is the left side. And she actually had three tumours in here, uh, one at the top, one in the middle there, and one at the bottom. Um, one of my colleagues did a partial nephrectomy uh, for the top and bottom, um, and they were a PT1A, G3, and a PT3A, um, and they were resected. She had a starting EGFR of 59. She had a little bit of post-op um, uh, renal failure, but then that recovered. So the plan was for me to do a four centimetre endophytic tumour um, to try and save the kidney. Unfortunately, and so that's what it looked like afterwards. Um, and then unfortunately, when it came time for me to ablate it, you can see it, it's a hell of a lot bigger at six centimeters. Uh, and I hadn't put a stent in because I thought it wasn't that big. But anyway, we treated her anyway. Um, and so I guess the point about this is, you know, we can treat quite big things. And actually, we really quite like endophytic tumors um, because we can see them and also um, the ice uh, doesn't extend out past the kidneys so much, so you don't have to worry about the, the bowel and stuff so much. Anyway, she was in hospital for two nights because she was from Devon. Um, she started off with the pre-op EGFR of 32, had a post-op um, EGFR of 21, um, and that's what it looked like with the ice, um, ice ball formed. So um, in conclusion, I would say it's currently impossible to make an evidence-based decision, uh, and I think that's pretty um, reiterated um, by Umberto as well. But I think if the aim of the salvage treatment is also to do what we were trying to set out to do in the first place, which is to minimize the risk of uh, post-op functional decline, then I definitely think um, we should be thinking about thermal um, uh, ablation uh, in post-nephrectomy bed recurrence um, and people with poor renal function and people with a high Charleston score. 
Um, but again, I think has been said, salvage treatment is not an either or. I think you need to pick the treatment according to the patient and the available um, expertise. Um, so I leave you with this thought. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Miles. Now we have listened to these lectures and uh, we will proceed with the open discussion and questions from anyone. Did Axel had some suggestions? Yeah, uh, so we have um, a few questions that came in. Um, one of them was um, actually very interesting. Uh, the question is more related to how should follow up look like in case of both positive and negative surgical margins? Um, that's a question I think to all of us, especially uh, the ones in the guidelines. Um, is anyone who would like to answer this question or give a comment? Yeah. If I may, I just can start saying what the recommendation in 2022 uh, are. In this case, uh, we, we included the positive surgical margins, especially for tumors larger than seven centimeters as a, a factor that should be considered to, uh, for example, select for that specific patient a more stringent follow-up uh, in order to detect uh, a uh, uh, a recurrence uh, and uh, to, to provide a, a potential uh, salvage treatment. So this is the only, I would say, recommendation that is included. And uh, the topic is uh, based on limited data. And this is probably what the guidelines uh, were able to, in the last years to highlight. So, so especially in larger tumors, I would say. I don't know if Bori may add something. No, the evidence base is very low for this um, local recurrence, and most of these cases should be treated. So it's very difficult to have a, a good um, recommendation what to do to, as a follow-up on this. But Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, as you know, we, we are currently even discussing whether follow-up for low-risk tumors at the frequency that is currently recommended would make sense because they normally, if they wouldn't have a positive surgical margin, their life, lifetime risk is about one to 2% to develop a recurrence. Um, for example, you see in these conditional survival analysis, then when patients are higher risk, uh, their risk may be 30 to 40%, and then it drops after three years, very often back to the 2%. And this could be one of the the reasons why one may argue that, you know, especially um, for these lower risk tumors, one might actually have much larger intervals. And as you say, Berger, there's very, very little evidence at the moment. We recently had a, a patient, for example, who had a local recurrence eight years after his partial nephrectomy. And that was outside of Garota, so it must have been there and sitting there for uh, almost a decade. Um, I think it's it's difficult to give a recommendation. Um, there are more questions coming in. There's there's also one. Um, it's it's a more practical question. Uh, it's someone who experienced a, a local recurrence, and then when they uh, performed the nephrectomy, the lesion was actually adherent to intestine. And the question here would be, would we recommend when we do partial nephrectomies to close the fat capsule or garota? Would that be something that could prevent something like this? Sorry, I think more a question for the surgeons, um, Umberto or Berje. May, obviously may, may, may help. However, in this case, probably the, the most important thing is the the, the clinical decision to perform the salvage, salvage treatment. I mean that uh, to have a positive surgical margins as uh, uh, Professor Bex uh, and all the other speakers, uh, speakers highlighted is not a, a, a direct indication for a, a salvage uh, uh, radical nephrectomy. So 
probably he, here the critical point is more the the decision rather than, than the surgical uh, uh, aspects but obviously the, the the closure of the uh, of the gerota in the primary tumor may help but will help only in those uh, who one percent of persons that are, are going to have a, a local recurrence indeed mm -hmm. One other question that came in uh, was specifically asking how would we know the presence of sarcomatoid uh, in a recurrence? And the question would be by biopsy, and I think that answers it as well, because um, uh, very often, I think at least where I work, we would very often try to biopsy a, a recurrence because we want to know whether it's the same tumor type or um, whether we are actually looking at a recurrence. I Remember, we had a case once of a um, desmoid uh, fibroma-like uh, growth form. It looks like a recurrence, but in the end, it's been benign. And this, I think, is also something that should be considered, certainly if it's not round-shaped and outside of the kidney. Can I just say something there, Axel? Because, I mean, I think it, it is important. We see it more in ablation, where actually you can get fat necrosis mimicking um, tumor so definitely when we first started doing ablation 10 years ago i think we didn't tend to biopsy stuff we just assumed that it was recurrence whereas now we biopsy everything and actually you can really be caught out by something being fat necrosis fat necrosis is amazing you know i've had a case where uh i think four years after treatment everything looked fine and you develop this enhancing nodule in gerota's fascia and i was just like oh well here we go uh, and we biopsy, you know, went straight through it and, and it and it came back as fat necrosis. And to be fair, a year later it's disappeared. So yeah. I think I think biopsy for these things uh, can be important, certainly, certainly for ablation anyway. I'm very grateful to uh, to this comment, uh, Miles. Uh, I think that, that that is really important. Another question that came in is um actually questioning a modality that we're seeing more and more now which is sbrt you know saber for um for kidney tumors anyone who wants to give a comment on that if, if i may i think unfortunately as a urologist that probably will be one of the most important options in the future uh, because uh, now there are several ongoing trials in the setting of metastatic rcc we are combining SPRT with the immunotherapy, especially pembrolizumab, and the the data are pretty good. So probably this is a something. A, a, this is an expertise that will become more and more important in the next future. So probably, uh, fortunately for the patient, obviously we this is, will be discussed in the multidisciplinary team. I think already in the in the next uh, two or three years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it depends on the expertise of this hospital uh, because SBRT is not available everywhere. And so this is one of the, the bias that we should consider. Yeah, I would agree. That there is um, one question that came in uh, is questioning whether there are any novel prognostic biological markers, blood, for example, bloodborne or liquid biomarkers for patients with a higher risk from local recurrence after partial nephrectomy. Um, I know a little bit about this. I mean, that there are some groups looking into, uh, it's a question which is closely related to active surveillance as well. So when you take a biopsy of a small renal mass um, in order to elucidate whether this is a tumor that could be safely observed or is something that is more likely to progress, and these studies are ongoing. Some of them make use of, for example, in, in uh, Tracer X, of, um, of the same driver mutations that have been described in metastatic and more advanced disease. But there are also some who investigate liquid biomarkers. I think it's an involving, evolving field. And again, here, I think what will be difficult in the future is the linkage between these very few rare recurrences to then actually predict for those ones who have not yet developed a recurrence, whether they ever will have one. I think it's, as we see, the, the highest predictors currently are having a positive surgical margin, the, um, the warm ischemia time, the complexity, and uh, some subtypes. 
And this also makes sense from a clinical point of view, but uh, this was a very good question. And I think we just have to wait for some of these results. Yes, this uh, liquid biopsies is, um, we still doesn't know really what to do, what to use. Mm -hmm. um, we had this Kim, Kim was um, promising um, biopsy, liquid biopsy, uh, showing changes in the kidney and um, it uh, could uh, define the pre-diagnostic uh, suspicion of renal cell carcinoma. Uh, we'll see. We need this um, liquid biopsies to screen these patients. Possibly we will have um, other things in the future. But today we we usually need to have these imaging checkups. Yeah. Now there's a question for you, Miles. Um, someone is asking, is there any size limitation for a percutaneous ablation? And um, what is the radiological finding post um, why ablation early and late? Is it the same? And is there any safe distance to avoid injury of adjacent structures? Yeah, so, I mean, size size is a good one. Um, I think everyone would agree that three centimeters for a, for, a, for a primary is absolutely, you know, no problem. There's a lot of evidence um, to suggest that ablation is absolutely fine with that. I take the view that ablation, it, it, you know, for me, and I'm talking just about cryo because I don't do microwave and I don't do RFA, but if you can create an ice ball that is big enough and covers the tumor by five millimeters minimum all around, then you can treat whatever size you like. The limitation is the surrounding structures that you don't want to cause damage to. So, you know, I have treated tumors. I think the biggest one we've done is I think nine centimeters. So you can do it. It's not a problem but it is the surrounding structures. And so this is where the quite sort of perverse thing about ablation is actually compared to you surgeons, I absolutely love fat patients. Fat patients for me are heaven because um, they've got lots and lots of um, fat around the kidney. And that means all the structures are, are far away from everything. Um, whereas a skinny patient's a nightmare. You've got to work hard. I mean, you can do it, but you have to work really hard to push everything out the way. Um, so size wise, I would say you can take anything on, but it depends on the patient's habitus. But, you know, officially, I would say four centimeters, um, absolutely, um, for ablation. Um, I think the guidelines would support that. I think the American ones, it's three centimeters, but yeah, they would support that. As far as how far you need to be away from something, um, you've got to remember that the edge of the ice ball is zero degrees. So actually, I'm quite happy for the ice ball just about to touch something. The only thing I get slightly touchy about is the bowel. The bowel is very sensitive. And what you don't want to be doing is your ice front to be going through something. Um, so normally, again, I'd say about five millimeters, you want to see the edge of the ice away, away from. Mm -hmm. I don't know, was there another bit or was that? No, no, that, that was it. Thanks a lot. Well, for you as um, head of the guidelines, uh, someone is asking where's the role of laser ablation? in local recurrence after partial nephrectomy? Hmm. That was a very tricky question. <laughs> I'm, I don't, I don't have, I haven't seen any publications on that. Same for me, yeah. Hmm. So we doesn't know, but uh, I, I suppose uh, minimal invasive treatments will come, um, whether it's radiation or, or cryo or uh, uh, RF or whatever. But um, the surgical situation when you do a, a rescue partial is very difficult. And um, mostly, uh, Miles, you had an idea that it was a complication if we couldn't do. Well, it's a complication when we have a local recurrence and need to make a surgery on it. So no, 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 yeah, I that, totally, I, no, 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 I, I, I totally understand, but it's just, it's just quite amusing that you've got this situation where it's like, yeah, yeah you know, oh, we, we did these radicals on people and there was no complications, but actually you started off wanting to do a partial. But and then I, we have, with then we have these patients with a single situation and uh, we need to really take care of these patients. Yeah. And, uh, no, no, I, treat, I, I, I totally agree. Treat those. Well. I was just wondering what the situation would be. I guess it's for me, the problem I've got is that if I 
thankfully I haven't yet, but if you stuff, if I stuff someone's kidney up, that's a major complication and I can't just whip the kidney out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. <clears throat> There's one, an, another question that came in, whether we would treat the same way um, a recurrence in a transplant kidney, for example. So there I would say it's maybe more de novo development um, after transplantation, but it's a, it's a very interesting question. I think at the at the Royal Free um, and Miles also knows that I think before transplantation, if they do have lesions in the native kidneys, we are asked to remove them. But after transplantation, if they do develop small lesions, we occasionally actually treat them focally rather than removing the transplant. And you may have questions about this, you know, because these patients are under um, immune suppression. Well, I think it's acceptable um, because they either will then have to go back to, um, let's say, revert to uh, dialysis again. And in, in some occasions, we've done these uh, focal therapies. And I think, Miles, you, you also have, I think... Uh, we've done, I think we've done three now, three transplant kidneys, yeah. um, and they've all been... Um, they've all been treated, they've all been treated successfully. And at the moment, we haven't had any um, recurrence. And that's, yeah, and, the, and their transplant's still functioning fine. Mm. So, yeah. And uh, there again, the, the couple of, uh, thanks, Miles. A couple of questions also related to you, uh, uh, again, where, uh, or directed to you. We've partly answered them, but they are about whether it's mandatory to perform a biopsy before thermal ablation. And one of them is specifically answering the question prior to cryotherapy for VHL. Um, so, so, so as far as a biopsy goes, um, absolutely, uh, well, I say absolutely, I would always insist if it was a de novo thing on having a biopsy, because as you, as we all know, you know, 20, even, even the older patients, 20% would be benign and you mm. wouldn't want to be doing an ablation on that. Very, very occasionally, if a patient is absolutely, you know, needle phobic or whatever, and doesn't want to have a biopsy and understands everything and they counsel properly, then you may do an ablation and do a biopsy at the same time. Um, the only mm. time when I wouldn't want a biopsy is if someone had a hereditary condition or something like that. And therefore, you can just assume, as I think you would in surgery, that it was that it was a tumor. So that's the biopsy one. What was this second one? Sorry. Well, it's it's um, it was actually in hereditary disease. Whether you would um, yeah. recommend? Well, I mean, hereditary biopsy. disease. Again, I think this is very interesting because what I didn't understand was that metachronous tumors were called recurrence i don't i don't like for me that doesn't quite follow because you know it's 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 a, it's a virgin thing that you're operating on i know that that for you the surgical bed will be uh um messed up but actually the the actual tumor itself is a virgin tumor and therefore i think it's very difficult it's very different from operating on uh, a recurrence within within a bed yeah. um and but we my view on um on hereditary tumors is slightly different to the view of some of the my surgical colleagues I know, but I think that ablation is absolutely the right modality for people with um, hereditary tumors because it is easy for us to go back in uh, and just keep on ablating people. And I have a number of people on my books who we're just regularly going in and treating. Mm. Uh, now I know one of my colleagues takes the view that if if someone is going to have be treated for their VHL, for example, he would rather the first time be partial nephrectomy and do everything he possibly can. And then at that point, it would hand over to me. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm just um, conscious of the time um, or mindful. We've got another six questions. Um, shall we answer them or are we time limited at the moment? By... I think we should try to answer what we can, but um, yeah. we, we need to close this also. But you can you can read the questions, please. So one of them is um, which histologic subtype is more commonly related with recurrence in uh, partial nephrectomy? I think uh, as I already demonstrated in one of these systematic reviews and also the studies after robotic assisted partial nephrectomy, the most commonest subtype was chromophobe RCC. 
And I think that is um, the reason why this is related because chromophobes do not have this classic pseudo capsule. Uh, that could be one of the reasons. Um, then again, I think most of the recurrences we actually see are clear cell, just because we treat more clear cells. Huh. Then again, a question for the group. I think that's also from an educational perspective, very important. Someone asks um, if we have, for example, a, a case of a patient with multiple kidney tumors in the same kidney, four centimeter or less, more than two tumors, and the other kidney is normal, which is the best treatment, partial nephrectomy or radical? Maybe Umberto, do you want to say something about this? Is, is a very important question, actually. Uh, I think that actually we, we should apply the same criteria that we use also uh, in the primary uh, disease setting. Uh, I see, I, I mean, that uh, all the comorbidities, age, life expectancy, all the things, uh, nephrometry scores, uh, all the, of the lesions, uh, all the all the, the things should be uh, put in together, uh, especially in a multidisciplinary team, because obviously, as I said also before, the expertise of the surgeon, the expertise of the interventional radiologist, uh, all these setting, all the, these features should be uh, put in together to 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 decide the best for the patient. Obviously, radical nephrectomy probably in presence of multiple diseases recurrent with a normal kidney, contralateral kidney, obviously probably is, is a good option, I would say more than uh, relative to the primary treatment setting where is a little bit more uh, probably something that we should discuss a little bit more. In this setting, it's probably easier as, as a final decision. Hmm. All right. Um, the other question relates to the technique which might then lead to recurrences. Someone wants to know, what do you think about tumor inoculation versus standard partial nephrectomy as the first approach? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a, some publications that says it's uh, no difference. But, um, uh, if you have a tumor invasion of the surroundings, uh, it might be more risky to leave tumor tissue behind. Uh, still, we doesn't really know if there is a huge huge difference between tumor and eclosion. Um, partly, I think they use um, not not the simple eclosion. They use um, they use to go in the capsule of the tumor, um, so it, it doesn't be so much different from a traditional uh, partial nephrectomy when you're just close to the tumor. Yeah. Sorry, can I just ask Umberto, did, 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 on that vein, did, did you have any data with your very interesting, sorry, about your different types of recurrence, the A and Bs, but the microvascular, did you have any data about whether those tumours had been enucleated or resected? Not in that details, because uh, the, the surgical series are very, very small. The Alessandro Antonelli series, for example, were roughly 20 patients, so they, they uh, went back to the primary treatment details, but uh, I think it's a little bit different uh, to extrapolate um, in specific uh, data in, in that specific setting. What yeah. is important, I think, is, uh, for example, if you have a surgical positive, a positive surgical margin is to have a early uh, imaging during the follow-up because uh, if this positive surgical margin is also associated with a visible uh, vital tissue that is probably a persistent disease, as I show you in the presentation, this uh, uh, probably is something that requires probably focal therapy or something uh, in, in the early uh, in, in the early follow up. So also this, I think, this is a message that uh, uh, was not uh, probably highlighted in the presentation, but is important also. The, the post-operative imaging, especially in case of a positive surgical margin. Yeah, thanks, Umberto. There's actually another question which relates to this um, indirectly. Someone is asking if post-partial nephrectomy, we find, for example, a one centimeter mass recurrence, when would you recommend salvage therapy? Wait a bit or jump on it? 
I think it, it, it's related to what I was saying uh, in, in my last answer, uh, because, for example, if the one centimeter is, is uh, something that you detect in a young patient with no comorbidities, in the first imaging that you perform, for example, after a partial nephrectomy with positive surgical margins, even that very small recurrence may be treated. Uh, it's a completely different uh, situation if the one centimeter recurrence is, for example, as you showed in the presentation, after three or four years after partial nephrectomy with negative surgical margins. So I think that size one centimeter is important but is for probably even more important to understand that one centimeter recurrence in, in which specific setting we are uh, experiencing the, that kind of recurrence. Yeah, thanks. We have two more questions and then, <laughs> then we can come to an end. Um, question, basically, I think both to you, Umberto, and also Miles, um, would you be open to perform a second conservative resection or focal therapy in case the patient is in good performance status and not progressing in other sites? And if it is technically possible, uh, would you always go to a radical procedure? Mice, I know if you want to take it. Or... Sorry, well, but in what setting? Sorry, this is the one centimeter recurrence after partial. No, no, it's just that, for example, someone develops a local recurrence, uh, the other kidney is normal, patient has a performance status, which is good, no distant metastatic disease, but the, the local recurrence would be technically amenable for either a repartial or a cryotherapy. Well, I think the I answer think is 100% you would, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. De definitely. I mean, my, my, my thing that I, you know, I, 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 I do believe although we've said the evidence is very poor that I, you know, I think that ablation in the, in the partial correct me bed is so easy to do that if it's a reasonable size and whatever, I think we should be looking at ablation. But yeah. I'm not taking argue against that if you like. No, I would agree. I mean, we've done a couple of local recurrences in the nephrectomy bed and as visibly as they are on the CT scan in, in the surgical reality that looks completely different. And you don't have the kidney to guide you like in a local recurrence in a kidney. So I think there's a good argument and SBRT is probably also encroaching on this field. Um, final question. And then I would like to hand over to Berge to, to close the session. That's actually directed to you, um, Umberto. Um, there's the question, what is actually the evidence for the adverse prognostic parameters you named in your presentation, especially for the short time to recurrence and sarcomatoid differentiation? I would say level of evidence three, because uh, uh, there are main uh, three uh, retrospective surgical series showing that those two factors are unfavorable characteristics that predict predict that, that kind of re recurrence. Uh, and unfortunately, two of the three papers included together partial and radical nephrectomy as primary treatment. So obviously, this is a, a recommendation that is based on retrospective studies and also uh, in a very heterogeneous uh, cohort of patients. Because as I said in the presentation, is, is a different uh, setting, the, the re recurrence of the partial or radical nephrectomy. But I think that uh, we can uh, at least uh, speculate that those uh, two factors uh, uh, may be important in clinical decision making. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all listeners. Thank you all the audience and uh, for all the questions. And thanks. Um, Miles Walton for your presentations on the cryotherapy of the recurrent tumors. Umberto for your presentation on the surgical treatments and uh, Axel for the introduction and all discussions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Still, we does not have you. the answers, but we have more questions. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.